Which part of the universe does the cosmic microwave background come from? Is Mars the best planet for habitability of all the ones we've found so far? How important is it to find a way to live off Earth? And in Q&A Plus, have we extracted everything we can from the cosmic microwave background? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are, across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them up, and I'll answer them here. As you can tell, I'm back in my studio. All right, let's get into the questions. Borg terraformers. Have humans found any other planets as habitable as Mars? I wonder if they do not realize how fortunate a gift they have right in their own backyard. The answer is actually no, because you know, we have found planets with a lot of characteristics that are interesting and potentially habitable, but there's still still a few pieces that have not been found yet. So, you know, imagine sort of like your perfect analog to the Earth. You've got an Earth-sized world that is orbiting around a sun-like star, and it is located within the habitable zone of that star. So liquid water can appear on its surface. And that that planet has an atmosphere. That would be the dream. That would be the ideal. Now, we've got little bits and pieces of those. So astronomers have found Earth-sized worlds orbiting around red dwarf stars within the habitable zone. They found super Earth planets orbiting around red dwarf stars and maybe sunish like stars. I don't even think so. Um, they've been able to detect the presence of the atmospheres of giant planets, but they haven't been able to detect the presence of the atmosphere around Earth sized worlds around sun like stars or even around red dwarf stars yet within the habitable zone. So right now we're still waiting to be able to actually detect an precise world orbiting around a sun like star. We're still waiting to detect the presence of an atmosphere, even at on an Earth sized world that is orbiting around an M dwarf or a sun like star. So Mars, you know, we know it has an atmosphere. Uh, so it is already vastly more habitable than anything astronomers have ever found. But I don't think astronomers are thinking that it's going to be the most habitable world we will ever find. Um, you know, there are a lot of stars out there and astronomers are finding a lot of planets. And so you can expect that, you know, this is not that these things don't exist. This is just that the tools have not been developed to the point that they're capable of resolving and confirming that these things exist. So Mars is okay, right? It's not great. It's got a bunch of things going for it. And then it's got a bunch of things that are going against it. So like, what does it have going for it? It has a solid surface that you can walk around on. It has dirt, you know, not really dirt, it has regolith crushed up rock, things on its surface. Its day length is about the same length of time as Earth. Uh, so just a little over 24 hours. Uh, it has an axial tilt, so it has seasons like the Earth. It has an atmosphere, but a very, very thin atmosphere. And that's about it. And then the things that it doesn't have is it doesn't have liquid water on its surface. It doesn't have a thick atmosphere in the way that Venus has a thick atmosphere, or even Titan has a thick atmosphere as a, you know, it's 1%. Um, it doesn't have any internal dynamo, it doesn't have plate tectonics, and so uh, has no protection from radiation. Um, so it's the, the top layer of the regolith is filled with toxic perchlorates. Uh, so, you know, the, the top layer is poison to plants. It receives about a quarter of the sunlight that you would get on Earth. So in other words, if you set up solar panels on Mars, you would have to set up four times as much solar panels to be able to receive the same amount of electricity. And so it's going to be very difficult to gather a lot of electricity on the surface of Mars. So, you know, there are a bunch of downsides, but it's better than nothing. I actually think the gift that we have is the moon. The moon, we have this large object that is only about 400,000 kilometers away from us. We have a like, surprisingly large moon compared to the size of the Earth. It has regolith. It is tidally locked to us so we can put a station on the surface of the moon and we can be able to communicate with it directly. We can go into lava tubes on the surface of it. We can be protected from the radiation. We know that there are reserves of water ice on the surface of the moon that we can use to mine to 
build propellant and have oxygen for astronauts and so on. So it is this incredible gift that is right beside us. And so, you know, for me, I think that we need to learn to really get to use the moon before we try to do any kind of long term presence on Mars, like obviously, like put some boots on the ground on Mars. But there's a lot of lessons to be learned about living long term in space that the moon can teach us. Oh, I didn't even mention the gravity on Mars, the gravity is a third. You know, we don't know if that's viable for long term living. Um, and we don't even know if the moon had one sixth. But if we can survive on the moon, then we can survive on Mars. So, uh, you know, Mars is fine. Mars is, is acceptable, but it's not great. You know, the universe could have done better. Could have like Venus is better if it had le not as thick an atmosphere. But you know, we get what we get. We have to work with what we've got. Wacky G. Is the cosmic microwave background for the entire universe? Or do we only see the part that corresponds to the observable universe? I mean, we have no way to know what is outside the observable universe. But you know, one of the main parts of astronomy is that whatever we see in our local universe is kind of the same for the rest of the universe. And so this idea of the cosmic microwave background radiation, this is a moment of time that was experienced by the entire universe about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe had cooled down, and the universe was transparent for the first time that light could finally reach space. And then this light of last scattering was was sent out into the universe and has been traveling ever since. And so when we look out into space, and we see the cosmic microwave background radiation, it is this sphere that we see around us where the light has been traveling for 13.8 billion years, you know, essentially the age of the universe minus 380,000 years to reach our detectors. And then one minute later, the sphere is a little bit bigger. And now the light has been traveling for 3.8 million years plus one minute, and then you wait another 10,000 years and the sphere is bigger. And in fact, if I looked up into space, and I could see the cosmic microwave background radiation, I would see one version of the observable universe. And if you were on another part of the planet, and you looked up into space, you would see a different view to the observable universe, you would see a different cosmic microwave background radiation, right? Because we are separated by 1000s of kilometers. And so different photons are being released at different times, different parts of space. And so no matter where you could go into the universe, you would see a different observable universe, you would see a different cosmic microwave background radiation, you were seeing the places that were throwing out that light that long ago. It's time to shout out all the new $5 patrons and above. Joshka McLeod, Andreas Kopfley, Jonathan Marshall, The Listening Well, Francis Bouchard, Mac Hicks, Dimitri Klebe, Harley Putnam, Jason Clemens, and Thorman. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. The unknown unknown. Fraser, please say the cheap but good binoculars for night sky viewing again. I promise to write it down this time. Okay, you ready? So the Celestron Skymaster. And I like the 15 by 70. And so you can typically buy them for about $100. They make a bigger version, they make a 25 by 100. And I've been tempted to pick those up. Because I, I love the sky method. Like I use them tonight to look at the comet. I use them all the time. But I would resist because they're much bigger and much heavier. So the 15 by 70 is like this nice balance, it gets you a good view to the sky. But they're not so big and heavy that your arms get tired when you're looking at things. Ramsey Zetterine, how important do you think it is that we find a way to live off world? I know we'll never have a better home than Earth. But to preserve life, shouldn't we be focused on living in space? I don't think it's very urgent for us to learn to live off world. We're not technologically advanced enough today. And we don't have the infrastructure today to be able to make a good time of it. Right now, we're in the let's explore phase of this process. We're not in the let's move to Mars, we're in the let's explore Mars, we're not in the let's move to the moon, we're in the let's explore the moon. Um, in the same way that we're in the let's explore Antarctica phase of our interaction with Antarctica. Now, who knows, maybe in the future, we'll build cities in Antarctica, that our technology will will get uh, very advanced. And the the analogy that I always use is Arizona, 
right? Phoenix. Phoenix is a hot place. I was never able to support large amounts of, of people. And now we have whatever 5 million people living in the city of Phoenix. And that's because we have technology that we mastered air conditioning and transportation and being able to bring water in from far away. We can survive in a place like Phoenix. But we have not got that same infrastructure on in a place like Mars or on the moon. 12 people have set foot on the moon. That is the extent of our ability to explore the moon, let alone live on the moon, or live on Mars. And so, you know, like, obviously, we all grew up and were excited by thanks to science fiction about humanity's future in space. And, you know, I think that our future across the solar system is inevitable, that we will one day be living across this solar system or our descendants or our robot overlords, who knows. Um, but it won't be soon. And and I think for a lot of people, you know, you're like, this is gonna happen in my lifetime, right? Right? And yet I'm sure there's some people here who are watching, you know, I've, I brought this up before you were there for the moon landings. Uh, you know, I was born right at the end of the moon landing. So you know, I don't remember them. But for those of you who are currently in your 60s, 70s, you watch the moon land and you're like, this is it. We are going to live that 2001 future. We are going to to live on the moon. We're going to live on Mars, that this is just the beginning of our bold future in space. And then nobody did anything for 50 years. And you were disappointed. Um, and, and now you're like, maybe it's not going to happen in my lifetime. And, and I think that, you know, we'll know that we're ready to live like to properly live on other worlds or even just in space once the infrastructure has started to come together. And that won't happen until after the exploration has properly begun. And we're looking at decades of exploration, maybe a century of exploration before we've built up enough infrastructure before it starts to make sense for us to try and have a longer term existence on other places. So, you know, I think whatever problems we face on Earth, we have to solve them here on Earth, that that no matter how bad we make the Earth, no matter how much we ruin the environment for ourselves, uh, it is still dramatically better than any other place in the solar system, right? You know, the best Mars we could possibly make after 10,000 years of terraforming would be terrible compared to Antarctica. So we have to really come to grips with the reality that we're going to live here on our planet for a very long time. And yet, you know, I always sound like I'm, I'm a doomer here, but we will inevitably be living across the solar system within a few hundred years, we will have conquered the entire place. It's just a time frame thing. WC03, we need to figure out how to lower the probability of doom before we start thinking about colonizing other rocks. You know, this idea of P, you know, use P doom, right? The probability of doom, but really that's, you know, the, the probability of artificial intelligence rising up and wiping us all out. This is an existential threat that humanity is facing right now. And hopefully we will get our act together and we will pause our development of advanced artificial intelligence. Hopefully we won't have any sort of scary disasters happen before we realize that this is a risky and very uh, bad behavior. But we're doing all kinds of other things at the same time, you know, only a small group of companies are recklessly uh, thrashing forward with artificial intelligence, uh, the rest of us are doing other stuff. And so, you know, let's keep exploring the solar system, let's keep investing in the stock market, let's keep raising our children, right? Like there's all this stuff life goes on. And hopefully wiser heads will prevail and we will reduce the risk of that existential threat and other existential threats. So you know, we can we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So let's keep exploring. Let's keep doing science. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, have we extracted everything we can from the cosmic microwave background radiation? And I'll put a link in the show notes.
All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Uh, thank you, everyone, who uh, joined me for the live show when we recorded this episode, uh, as well as everybody who put your questions into the YouTube comments. Now, uh, I'm back in the studio. I just finished recording my first live stream from the month-long hiatus when we were in Thailand. Uh, so that's recorded. That's in the can. But uh, there'll be an event here on the channel for the next one, which is going to be Monday, December 22nd at 8 a.m., Pacific time, uh, 11 Eastern time, and that's going to be for the Europeans. But of course, anyone can watch it. Uh, so there'll be an event here on the channel if you want to be able to watch that. I'm going to talk about some TV shows that I am excited about. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Barry Lake Roofing, Brian Bode, Caradorn, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Sai Nelson, Dark Finger, Dave Verbeoff, David Gilton, and David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Nordspace, One Step for Animals.org, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fallon Munley, Team 49, Telescopes Canada, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So there's been some interesting science fiction recently and shows that I am looking forward to. So I thought I would just sort of bring you up to speed on what we've been watching here in the house. Uh, so first, we finished watching, the, I guess, the first half of the last season of Stranger Things. So season five, episodes one through four, and I guess they're going to make a movie for the last episode. I don't know how this is going to work. I'm not really paying attention. It's fine. Stranger Things. It's fine. You know, like I think the first season was very nostalgic and they had a great take and uh, sort of felt very much like me being a child growing up in the 1980s. Like it they like really put a bullseye on my head. But, uh, you know, I'm a little tired of it at this point. But, yeah, you know, I'm going to watch it to the end. And so it's fine. But the show that I'm probably looking the most forward to is Fallout Season 2. And this is based on the video game, and yet they've done a terrific job of this. And while the sort of the first one uh, was sort of set in the environment around where the Fallout Shelter was, the second one, they've gone to New Vegas. And of course, those of you who have played Fallout New Vegas, which is the best Fallout game, they're going to the best city in the Fallout franchise. And so I am really looking forward to that. And that's going to be happening in sort of mid-December. So like any day now. And then early next year, we're going to have a Blade Runner 2099. I have sort of no expectations. The other show is going to be Starfleet Academy, which is going to be a spinoff of Star Trek Discovery, but focused on people at Starfleet Academy. Probably not my bag, but we'll see. I'll give it a shot. I'll watch the episodes and, and see what I think. And then shows that I've been excited about recently, of course, is Pluribus, which I think is like the best show of the year. Although Alien Earth also came out this year. And up until Pluribus, I was saying that Alien Earth was the best show of the year. And so they must fight in my mind. But both of them are absolutely worth your time, as well as Murderbot. So uh, it's been a really good year for, for science fiction. Next year, we're going to probably get season two of The Three Body Problems. So, uh, so too much to watch. All right, we'll see you next time.